Well, thanks very much for the, uh, the privilege of your attention and for the opportunity to talk to, uh, to dialogue with you about some areas of interest that are uh, quite pronounced for me and that I have a high level of interest in broadly because I believe they're critical for addressing some of the large pressing challenges that we face societally. I have the opportunity to reflect on what we expect or what education might look like as we go forward. What's the impact that it might have on society? How will it structurally be different from the kinds of opportunities that we engage in today as a higher education system? How will it internationalize? How will it impact uh, globally? How will it impact the competitiveness of different school districts or different regions or different countries? So I want to address this in really a four-part uh, discussion or four-part topics. I'm going to talk at you for about uh, 40, 45 minutes or so, and uh, then we'll have a fair bit of time for Q&A because I'd be uh, more interested in hearing uh, what some of your experiences are and how you've encountered different aspects of, of digital learning. So much of my view of the future of education is really framed around digital technologies and the way in which digital technologies impact knowledge. So very broadly speaking, I will say that if you want to understand the future of education, you have to understand the architecture and structure of knowledge. How are we creating knowledge? How are we sharing it? How are we validating it? Who has power and control to create it? Who has power and control to prevent its creation or its dissemination? And so I'll do that discussion around the future of universities or the model what the university might look like through uh, looking at some of the trends, this broad idea of latency, which I'll clarify a little bit, is probably a little vague right now. And uh, then I want to talk about the university writ large. What are some of the changes that we're observing? that are going to alter universities from a single entity system as we know them today to something that will look much more like an ecosystem with a range of players and a far more complex impact on society and unfortunately also as a byproduct more political and more uh, confrontational interactions as well. And then I want to briefly look at what then is the future in terms of higher education. What will a university look like in an era that is more or less fully digital or at minimum is increasingly digital first? And how does that impact our residential spaces or traditional university environments? So let's start with trends. Probably not much of a shock to anyone here, but there are some fairly dramatic changes in terms of the labor market. And I know universities are more than a system for preparing learners for work, but we can't overlook the significance of that aspect of higher education. There's much more at stake in terms of creating societies of informed citizens, society of individuals who are thoughtful and compassionate and aware of the challenges that face a region that are able to provide commentary and a counterbalancing influence to the existing power structures of society. So those are all roles that universities play, but they also play a significant role in terms of employment and employment opportunities. And this is where some of the jobs that are changing and disappearing start to become quite pronounced. This is particularly true regarding automation and the growing influence of uh, robotics, artificial intelligence. It's true in terms of the portion of society's work that's being conducted as knowledge related work and what's being conducted more so as traditional manufacturing related work and I'll get a slide on that in a bit. By the way, for any of you, uh, all of the, the slides or the references here are in the, in the notes of the, this presentation so I'll share that with, with the organizers and, and they can share it with you if you're interested in, in any of the references. We're also seeing in developed regions of the world, production work is a small part of the overall economy. The vast majority of work that's being done in society now is work that's done in either interaction or transaction jobs. What at one point we used to call knowledge work, even in regions such as China that are still heavily industrializing countries with a strong manufacturing base, those regions are also experiencing a decline in those types of jobs and a net increase in knowledge related work. And if you want to get a sense of just what does that look like visually, this is a graph of the largest industries by state in terms of employment. 
And so this graph is from the 1990s. You really see two images predominantly reflected, uh, manufacturing, which is blue, the red, which is retail. And then you see uh, you know, a few little differences there with uh, accommodation or food services. But this is the structure of the largest employees in the 1990s in the U.S. As of 2013, you've seen a fairly dramatic reversal where the largest sector of employment now, perhaps not surprisingly, but it's healthcare, which you would expect with an aging population. Uh, but uh, you're also seeing the, the shift now where manufacturing is really limited to about a handful or a dozen, uh, half a dozen states or so. Vast majority is healthcare, uh, still a little bit with accommodation and a bit more with retail. But there's a, there's a dramatic change in the economy and the economic structure, not just of the United States, but globally. Another aspect that's quite consequential trend-wise is what's happening around our student population. So in a word, our students are diversifying. The students that we've had in the past are not the students that we're getting today. And they're different on a range of uh, different elements, if you will. First of all, they're no longer the majority of students. Full-time students are now less than half of the student population in the U.S. at least. These systems, the enrollment numbers that are emerging, favor women over men. It's also a greater percentage of the population that's entering higher education. In some regions, it's as high as 60%. Part of the intent with Obama's uh, sort of first in the world call was to try and bring uh, U.S. back into a leadership position for uh, highest uh, nations with in terms of secondary post-secondary education. We're seeing a greater number of students that enter the university sector as well that uh, have already spent some time either in the workforce or just doing something else. So they're entering universities not sequentially necessarily. In some cases it's the workforce first and then entering uh, the university sector. And then other areas certainly that you can expect that growing internationalization is a significant element. We're also seeing the racial ethnic diversity of universities increasing as well. Uh, this is uh, s stats from uh, California, which shows that uh, the white student population as a percentage is decreasing, with uh, the Latino population increasing most significantly. If you look at it broadly across all public universities in the U.S., white student population this year, 2014, for the first time, dipped below 50% as a majority of the student, uh, student population. In five years, that's expected to drop about another 3%. And the big gainers uh, are in the Latino and uh, Asian and biracial populations. Uh, the rest of the populations either hold stable or have slight declines. So it's a different university system or different university market that is going to be uh, uh, coming knocking on our doorsteps. And in response to some of the changes in the labor market, the different profiles of learners, we're also seeing changes around the structure of learning itself. Learning being more granularized, reflective of modularized learning. Some of you may have seen the report released by MIT last week or some of the uh, publicity that uh, Wisconsin has received around their interest in creating modules, not full courses, reducing, this is with their MOOCs in particular, but it's this idea that we are taking what used to be a 12-week course and we're making it smaller, we're chunking it down, and also taking greater acknowledge, acknowledgement of what has happened around prior learning assessment and recognition. What did you do before you got to university? What do you do in your spare time? Uh, what did you do while you were in the workforce? So those factors are involved. That then also creates a context for granularization of assessment meaning that the way in which we evaluate students moves from course-based assessment to something that starts to look a little bit more like badges, but badges still have a certain stigma to them, but something that says we are not going to evaluate you at a course level for competence anymore, we're going to evaluate you at a competency level, at an individual competence. And uh, there's a range of opportunities around what that might look like going forward. Add to that, in the U.S. right now, we're seeing a significant increase. You don't need to necessarily look at the, the stats here because, well, you probably can't. But uh, the general point is that uh, about 12.5% of the student population in the U.S. Uh, has taken online uh, courses. And if you look at some of the work done by the, uh, what's now called uh, the, what is it? it used to be the Sloan C Consortium, but the online learning, okay, that's them. Uh, I just felt like I was a preacher there for a while. I'll rise and repeat after me. 
<laughs> but um, so the uh, that organization, they say it's up to 30% of students have taken at least one online course. The stats that were presented here by uh, the National Center for Educational Statistics looked at the number of students that had taken sort of substantial online or been exclusively involved in online or distance learning. So as a result, we end up with this landscape where, in a nutshell, we have a complexification of higher education. We're serving a broadening student base that has a different range of needs. We have a society that is experiencing some fairly dramatic shifts economically and in terms of employment. The single narrative of a university just doesn't suffice anymore. Much like the idea of a university, Newman's uh, emphasis that's now you know 100 plus uh, years old, the idea of a university today needs updating because it's changing, it's expanding, and it's evolving. Now there's a few ways in which this will go, and I'll talk about this a little bit later on in the presentation, but broadly speaking, we have an opportunity either to have the university become a much more integral and prominent organization in society. I think there's a very real opportunity that that will be the outcome. But we also have a potential situation that will see the university become less prominent and actually diminish in influence as uh, an ecosystem of startups and other organizations come in. Here's why I'm particularly interested in seeing the university continue to not only grow but to thrive and increase its influence in society. And that's largely to do with this idea of what is knowledge and what happens in a knowledge uh, process. So just humor me, everybody's got to have little four by uh, you know, the, the two by two matrix uh, to try and articulate something. So let's talk about learning and knowledge from a range of different needs that we engage in on a daily basis. So if you look at your top left, it's daily sense making. This is what happens when you wake up one morning and it's like, oh crap, I have a kid. And, uh, <laughs> and you got to figure out, like, what do I do? And so this is where you have all the experiences of, oh, she's sick, I've got to take her to a doctor. or oh, this is So this is a process where we, we're interacting with the world on a daily basis, and that process of daily interaction, uh, we're learning. We're making sense of the world around us. And, and it might be through how we, we interact with our uh, work activities. Somebody comes in and says, by the way, uh, you know, Angel is going to no longer be used. We're moving to Blackboard or some such discussion. This is all a process of daily sense making. Largely, these are low-level knowledge tasks but they're often quite urgent knowledge tasks because we need them right now to do something. Then we have, if you drop down from there, this is what university has largely done to date, which is we map to existing knowledge. Somebody somewhere knows something, we bring students in and we try and duplicate. Uh, what the faculty member knows. We take them through a course, we take them through a master's program, and especially if you've taken any of the open online courses that have gained prominence, you're familiar with it's very much a container-based model. Like, I know this, or this is what's known, you are over here, you will be filled with this knowledge, and away you go. Uh, this is an important area of learning, but I don't think it's the area of learning going forward, because we enter a complex, emerging, uh, social, cultural landscape, that has pressing problems that aren't necessarily able to be addressed by applying a matrix or a pre-existing framework to that problem. We're very much facing a challenge that whether it's like the SARS outbreak in 2003 or today it's with Ebola or it could be with uh, the financial crisis of 2008, but we're in a climate and in a culture both economically uh, educationally, our knowledge needs, and societally, where we are facing a landscape that shifts rapidly. And that means tolerance for ambiguity, willing to accept the answers aren't known, but collectively we can often find those answers if we're networked and connected properly. That's the landscape. So as much as this has been historically an important area of, of learning and knowledge, it's no longer the, the uh, exclusive domain where I think we need to be. So instead, I would argue that this is sort of that crisis framework, uh, the top corner. This is where big things go wrong, like 2008, where we rapidly need to try to mobilize and make sense of our landscape. The bottom, your bottom right, is this idea of new knowledge, and that's with creativity and creation and innovation. Uh, OECD recently did a report on the innovation capacity of higher education as a whole. We didn't fare overwhelmingly well. There's a, a few uh, lack of confidence in the system in some levels. But then you see uh, regions of the world, this reading on uh, Canada, a uh, report from Canada today that looked at the growing influence of universities as an outsource opportunity for corporate uh, research and development. So there's some interesting elements up in play that, that we need to uh, try and get a better sense of or to make sense of what that means. So largely our existing educational practices address these quadrants of stability. 
whether it is stability in terms of daily sense making activities or stability in terms of, oh, I need to take a master's in data science because the way the world has traditionally worked is a trend slowly starts, it builds, it builds, employment fills out and that just keeps happening. 20 years later, it might dwindle out a bit and away you go. I think we need to start acclimating ourselves to two to five year careers, meaning a knowledge domain emerges, explodes, has a huge impact, fades, someone else comes in or some other knowledge discipline comes in because that's the nature and the pace of development. So more and more, we're gonna start looking at something where the future of work, and this is, as I mentioned earlier, and I'll mention again and again later, is that um, if you want to understand the future of the university, understand the architecture and structure of knowledge today. And we're now in a space where we have this need for uh, knowledge that responds to crises or knowledge that responds to newness and to innovation. Unfortunately, the uh, university system is in a bit of a bad space today. And since 2008, certainly in the U.S., it has had some fairly significant challenges. And these challenges have put, for lack of a better word, uh, I'll use the term that we've put universities into something that looks a bit like a revenue vice. So by revenue vice, I mean we have seen a decline in state support almost across, there's been a slight uptick in the last year, but after, this was after significant uh, decreases. We're starting to see a small increase in support again. But there's also a blocking element now, which is that we don't have the same flexibility in tuition that we've had in the past. And that produces a significant challenge uh, for us because in the past it was if the state said we're cutting your budget X, you could say fine, we'll raise our tuition X. And now all of a sudden we get to a point where universities, especially smaller universities, are not able to increase their tuition to offset the decrease in, in uh, public support for universities. And that's reflected even just in this general idea of pricing power and uh, that so this is from a Wall Street Journal uh, article in 2013 that looked at the declining opportunities that universities have to increase tuition and the way that this actually for good reason has a way of terrifying leaders as uh, and unfortunately this quote let me just quickly rectify that quote why did that move there I don't know or will I come back all right, apparently I will not move that over there. Anyway, so uh, the general idea here is that, uh, as, as one leader had stated, that we are at a point now where we don't know where we're heading. We don't know what the structure is of universities going forward. I'm not going to touch my laptop. <laughs> we don't know where my laptop went. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I've got my mouse is, uh, is flaky. Anyway, so if I get back to here, I will continue talking at you. So these are uh, the issues around uh, pricing and pricing powers that we have this tuition vice or this revenue vice that is really put many universities in a spot where they're going to need to think differently about future revenue. And I'll deal with that briefly when I return to the structure of the university and a couple of points down. I want to talk about something that at first I think might seem like, well, what does that have to do with your talk today, George? But hopefully it'll become clear as I go forward with it. So quick question, what do these things have in common? Airbnb, now they have a new logo now, but apparently it's very adult. Uh, Uber, yeah, Flickr, Blogger, and just to mess you up, I'll add this one to the equation. All of these share one attribute, which I think is probably the most defining attribute of the digital age. And that is the activation of latent capacity. So if you look at, let's say, a system like Airbnb, which basically allows you to make, if you have living space and you're not around, you can make it available. Or with Uber, you have a vehicle, anyone can suddenly start uh, playing the role of a taxi driver. So it's, it's activating the latent capacity that exists there. Or things like Flickr, sharing our images and making them available. The same thing, I mean, where did all those YouTube videos, all those cat videos and all those uh, whatever, where did they go but pre uh, YouTube or tweets? I mean, this is, there's this sense in which these technologies, the ones that have been most successful, have done one significant thing, and that is they've activated some kind of existing latency that exists in human communication systems. 
Uh, at some level, you get systems like SETI and others that activate a network latent computing capacity. Google's technology infrastructure, one of the things that it did exceptionally well, and if you're familiar with the story of Google, uh, started, as you're aware, a couple of uh, doctoral students at Stanford. They didn't have any money, so when they set up Google, they had to basically run around the university, scrounge the hardware pieces that they needed to try and run their servers, but be, because they couldn't afford the top of the line servers that was the norm that day for, for uh, web work. And so they ended up uh, spending their time, they had poor hardware, they spent their time making their software useful, so building in redundancy, uh, you know, trying to speed up the pace of, of processing by adding, instead of having you know, two massively expensive computers, they could have 500 cheap computers of which 10% could fail at any time and the whole system would still work. So it's just this general idea of latency. Then you start looking at things such as a range of movements that haven't all generated the outcome that was initially predicted, whether it's the impact of Occupy Wall Street or discussions around Arab Spring or any of the tools that we've looked at. We have this fundamental technological drive to extend humans' capability, cognitive capabilities more generally, through the use of digital resources and technologies. So much like the frailty of humanity's inability to till the soil with our hands, we developed tools that enabled us to do that. Our inability to uh, share quickly, readily, because of physical and a range of other constraints, we're developing cognitive agents that enable us to activate the latency and the desire that we have for that level of communication. Now, what does this mean for knowledge? Well, I'll just call this very briefly this 100 people in a room theory of knowledge, which is that if, and we've probably got, let's say, roughly that number in the room, we all have enormous latent knowledge capacity. All of you are uh, brilliant, informed, educated people, but you're all sitting here while one person has trouble with his mouse. And uh, there is an enormous inefficiency in that model. There is an enormous inefficiency in the latency that exists when you have a room full of people like this, or if you have a lecture hall full of students, or if you have an online course full of learners. If you take a traditional structured approach, those people in the room have enormous capacity to teach one another a range of things that, uh, that would be startling. I mean, if I was to say, who here majored in biology when you were uh, going, or had a significant major mind, whatever, in biology? All right, so we've got one person who can teach us, uh, but what about stats? Who's got an affinity for statistics? We've got several there. What about uh, your calculus uh, students? I mean, somebody, okay. So, you know, as if, you, if you were to go through, now the issue is, uh, is that we don't reveal these things to ourselves. Like, we don't go out and say, I know these things. We don't wear it in an obvious way. And I'll, I'll return to this again a few, in a few points, but it's this sense that we don't have the technical infrastructure that allows us to let others know the things that we know. And if only there was a way outside of somebody saying, hey, what do you know about biology or what do you know about stats? That, that's the, there's an inefficiency in our technical systems in education today that don't allow us to activate the latent knowledge capacity that exists in a class or that exists in a course. Now, there's a huge benefit when you have a system like this. So uh, it really is the power of integration. So Facebook, many of the things that Facebook did many of us were doing online since the late 90s. We were doing, we were sharing images, we were sharing posts and updates, we were at that point using uh, you know, a reader, RSS reader, and sharing on blogs and collaborating on wikis, and sometimes you had to host your own website to share your images, or whatever you did, but we were doing all of the things that Facebook essentially allows us to do. But what Facebook did was it integrated those fragmented experiences, and by integrating those fragmented experiences, all of a sudden there was a significant increase in the number of people in society that could participate in that space. Up until then, you had to be able, you had to have your own web server, would be nice. You had to have basic familiarity with, uh, with simple uh, tools or technologies like HTML or uh, you know, being able to create your RSS wrappers or whatever you did. You had to have some familiarity with those, those types of things. But all of a sudden, Facebook comes along and it does everything that these other tools did, but it integrates it in a way that suddenly activates the ability for people to share annoying status updates. And so in education, that's precisely our challenge. We're waiting for this type of thing. We're waiting for our latency activating tools, and, and they'll come, it's just a matter of time, because the ability for us to essentially make transparent what you know, 
to declare the knowledge that we possess to whether that's done explicitly or mind, because increasingly it is data mind. And then the ability to create a persistent and ongoing knowledge map or identity, I think, is really uh, one of the key critical areas that universities have to address going forward. So that's this idea of latency. It hopefully will become a little more clear why I address that. Let's talk a little bit about the university. So higher education is under a range of dramatic pressures, as I already referenced, ranging from the economics to the changing uh, student population to the changing workforce. It's important to emphasize that the university, though, is not a business, per se. In fact, uh, as this, this quote from uh, uh, Bill Power, the president uh, of uh, UT Austin, stated that in many ways, you know, the university has business-like processes within it. These need to be managed like a business, but it's a mistake to say that just because we enroll students that we now need to make the learning process equally structured and business-like. That's a mistaken assumption. So the recognition is that while there are business-like elements in higher education, and those have grown in interest, we very much need to emphasize that the experience of a university is entirely different and outside, or maybe not even outside, but has a completely different set of metrics for success. Because whereas a business's output and success is reflected in quarterly or annual reports, a university's success is reflected in the uh, generational success of a region or of a society. Now, one of the things that happens in this landscape, though, is we have a, a, an awareness that a course perhaps doesn't have the longevity that it once had, that the very idea of a class needs to change, and this unbundling of classes is going to have a reasonably substantial impact, because right now the credit hour and everything related, especially in the U.S., but the funding model and everything around that is so pronounced around the credit model that if we do away with that, it, it really throws a lot of these elements up in the air. And so the idea of class being replaced by modules or the idea of competency-based education is something that we need to acclimate ourselves to in terms of how it adjusts much of what we do in terms of existing business practice. And for a lot of academic leaders, this is an important challenge because academic leaders, business officers in particular, uh, only a, one in four strongly agreed that their business or their, their, their university, their institution had a sustainable financial model, even in the short term. Once you started moving beyond five years in length, that dropped to uh, roughly 13, 12, 13 percent. So the people who are leading the academic structure of the university and seeing the writing on the wall for a variety of reasons, they don't have a lot of confidence that our universities are moving in a direction or in a pathway that, uh, that is desirable. And that means that we're going to see a far greater commercialization interest on campuses because universities are changing the previously stable supply of tuition dollars and government dollars is being replaced by a hodgepodge of different corporate sponsorship and other uh, arrangements that are trying to fill the gap between that uh, revenue vice. Other challenges for the university probably most pronounced is beginning to think outside of the current structure of the university. We are very strongly tied to the legacy education system, even now with the whole issue with MOOCs. The biggest criticism of MOOCs that I keep hearing is low completion rates. I mean, MOOCs were never about low completion rates. It's this idea of who completes a library. I mean, it was, it was a completely different set of metrics for MOOCs, and yet we see a new technology through the lens of our existing experiences, and it's discounted or weighted based on those premises, and yet there's a lot happening in online and digital learning that isn't comparable to the university. In fact, it in many ways will pose some challenges to the existing physical structure of the university. One of the areas that's perhaps most pronounced in this, or perhaps has the, uh, the significant, uh, most significant opportunities around it, is the idea of personalization and adaptivity. Instead of one course, or one faculty member, or one course for 25 students, you have basically 25 courses for 25 students. And there are organizations, Newton and Smart Sparrow probably being among the most prominent, that are moving in this adaptive, personalized learning landscape that ends up doing something to the effect of saying, well, what if we can map learner knowledge? Doesn't matter how they developed it, formally or informally, in a university classroom, in a MOOC, doesn't matter. 
If we understand the architecture of knowledge in a discipline, so in order to be a physicist, this is a mapping of the knowledge and the attributes and the, the view or the, the competencies that a physicist needs to have. Uh, the opportunity then to say that all of us take a different pathway through universities at a granular level. Not we take a different pathway through courses, but we take a different pathway through competencies depending on where it is that we want to end up. And this reflects one of the pressing challenges that were just starting to emerge and it's a narrative that's actually a little more pronounced than I thought it would be by now but it's this idea of unbundling of the university and there's a lot of glee in this because especially folks who have let's say a venture capital uh, interest or recent uh, op-ed by the uh, governor of Utah about we need to smash the the uh, the university cartel or the the uh, you know, the recognition cartel, I guess, if that's the word. Uh, this idea being that universities as an integrated and end-to-end -end system are in for some serious changes because that is not going to be the case going forward. It's not going to be case either for a variety of reasons because we're going to outsource more and more of the functionality that we're doing, much like the business community went through an extensive outsourcing period uh, 20, 25 years ago as they started to bear, you know, pull back to bare bones minimum. And I think from a university end, what's happening is as we unbundle our uh, student recruitment and as we unbundle some of our assessment, because if you look at ASU's partnership with Newton, or if you look at uh, some of the organizations or universities that Pearson has bought in UK, there is a sense of starting to unbundle the traditional university relationship with a range of corporate providers playing in a, a greater role. Now that's not a necessarily a bad thing because all of us here are sitting on certainly chairs developed by corporations and laptops developed by corporations, so it's not an anti-corporate rant. What I'm saying is that the university structure of the future will be one where we no longer have an end-to-end -end integrated system. It'll be an ecosystem that's going to have a range of different partners and providers that go beyond just the technology providers we have today that increasingly start to look at service providers. Organizations like Academic Partnerships, organizations like Newton, organizations like 2U that will come in and conduct for a university some critical core functionality elements that a university has perhaps not had the vision to build the competency in or that a university has, uh, there's a sudden change in their local marketplace and it's the only way they can get their product to market in a timely fashion. So start thinking ecosystems rather than end-to-end -end integrated systems. And at some level, this is uh, an idea that, that's uh, recently come out is this idea that the new American university, and this was based on some criticism of Arizona State University, but that the new American uh, university is going to be massive online and corporate backed. And that was reflected as well with the recent partnership between Starbucks and, and ASU as well. ASU has self-declared as, as uh, you know, basically the new American university, and they've done some very innovative things. I don't know of a president in the U.S. education system that has, done, has had a bigger say in influencing university that, than Michael Crow has because it's, what they've been able to do with their system has been... Uh, significant. Agree or disagree with it, that's irrelevant. They've, well, it's not, but for this purpose, it's irrelevant because uh, they've made a big dent in shifting what a university is and what it looks like. And you start to see more and more this kind of complex ecosystem relationship where you have ASU that is, that's partnering with Pearson for content and Newton for adaptive learning, and you, you don't have this, the identity of a university is, is an entirely different thing than it was. Another model that hasn't quite gained the recognition or the attention yet that uh, perhaps it had the potential to, but it may going forward, is uh, activity out of uh, around competency-based education. So whether it's the, the University of Wisconsin flexible degree where you have the opportunity to basically go out, do some learning in the corporate setting, uh, you might fill gaps in a university or just get recognized with it. You can do your entire degree program exclusively online uh, or ex exclusively competency-based. You never have to do a step onto a university campus if you don't want to. So that then leaves universities in this position of how do we innovate? We know we need to innovate. We see a different landscape. We see that we might lose some of our core integrated system. So I'll just briefly put out four possible models that might provide us with some guidance for what universities are going to become. First of all, integrated. Uh, this is not going to be the norm. There will be a few universities, those that are perhaps have particularly visionary leaders or have a certain amount of deep pockets, they'll be able to create the integrated university system going forward. And this is a little bit like the edX model, which edX 
uh, goes into, so if you set up, you join edX as a partnership, you're you know, UTA X or Harvard X, but it's this idea that you innovate as a system by starting to experiment with these online delivery formats, but the knowledge stays locally. That's a big output uh, for, that differs from some of the other uh, open online course providers where the knowledge resides with a corporate entity. In many cases, there's some local faculty involvement, but with that model. So universities, there's that approach that as universities embrace digital learning and face the digital reality, that they start to create these, uh, these innovative spaces that will help to eventually bring the rest of the university into a digital space. I've already mentioned partnership. It's this outsourcing approach where you build in the capacity that you lack. You hire it or, or you pay for it. And uh, then there's the, the, another approach which I haven't seen much of. I'm aware of about three or four universities that have started to do this now, but where they create separate legal entities that allow them to move around the constraints of an existing university. Some cases, the one organization in Australia, uh, the interest there is once they move forward with enough momentum and innovation, they can demonstrate what they're capable of, that their learning will be pulled back into the existing university campus. And so, uh, but it's this idea that we can't innovate under the umbrella because there are too many barriers, too many people that push back at innovation. Not everyone sees this as a crisis situation that requires a significant response. And then the fourth one, which is uh, something that quite a fascinating idea has been partnered, uh, done with some of the online learning organizations like Ambanet that Pearson purchased to you and, and Amer academic partnerships that I mentioned. These are systems that will go to work with the university, build their online program, and then that online program will essentially be uh, a revenue share relationship where they'll each get a part of it. It's an interesting model, needless to say. So those are some approaches to how universities are starting to think about innovation and how either they do it on their own, they do it in partnership, they do it separate, or they do it uh, with an equal uh, arrangement with an external provider. All right, so for the, the uh, last few uh, slides, I want to turn a little bit to this idea of the future and what this might mean from a university end. So stop me if you've heard this before. That's it, actually, I'm not going to say it. You can just read it. So, because um, I've already said it so often. So here's what we've done in the past. In the past, we've had this idea of the, the university. What do we monetize? Like, what do we make money from with our students? So if you have content, curriculum, and teaching, uh, and then you have the learner and you have the assessment. Now, there was a research element which is completely different from all of this, but from the teaching and learning approach, this was the university. We monetized. Often we gave the, eventually the publishers. We used to monetize everything here, but we did give the publishers the ability to monetize the bulk of the curriculum in the form of textbooks and digital resources. But we still contained or re retain control of monetizing the teaching process and monetizing the assessment process. Now, one of the truths I think that we need to get a better grip on is that what can be duplicated with limited costs can't be monetized in digital environments. Meaning, if you do a lecture and it's recorded, then ideally that is something that you don't need to invest in. Again, if it's a good quality recording and production, it's easy to duplicate. It costs you pennies, if that, for each additional person that views it. On the other hand, if you engage with a group of students in a very rich learning activity that's uh, activity-based or immersive, then if you have 20 students and one instructor, if you're going to do it with 40 students, you have to add a second instructor. So a big thing for university leaders to think about is what is that thing that we can do within a university that cannot be duplicated easily technologically? Because that's your future economic value point. Because if it can be easily duplicated, someone will duplicate it. And uh, so you have to look at different approaches. So in this case here, this is the idea that curriculum and content can easily be duplicated. In many cases, some of the, the open online courses and the content that's now available with a minimal social layer wrapped around it provides a limited opportunity for us to add value. You add the growing interest in MOOCs and informal learning and so on. We need to start thinking about where is our monetization value point. And I'll emphasize that whereas we used to monetize the content and the, the teaching process, going forward we're going to monetize the gaps in knowledge based on a competency model. Or we'll monetize the uh, relationship between work-based learning and what they already know with regard to a formal degree or for some kind of formal type of credentialing uh, or recognition. So the, the teaching, we can't monetize that. We used to. When MIT first did their open courseware initiative in 2003, uh, a lot of folks were saying, well, that's 
crazy. I mean, you're giving away your content, but MIT made the argument, well, no, it's the MIT experience that people want. The content isn't our economic value point. Uh, but then all of a sudden, um, MOOCs come along, and all of a sudden, the practice of teaching broadly, I mean, it's not necessarily the best practice when you look at a talking head, but still the practice of teaching broadly reflects what is going on or what happens in a lot of university classrooms. Unless you've got a small classroom of 20 students and one faculty member, a lot of lecture halls, the MOOC experience is about as good as what you get there. And so suddenly we can't monetize the content because it's free and open with a range of courses. We can't monetize teaching and that leaves us really with monetizing emerging immersive learning experiences as well as rich assessment processes and the value layers that we add around filling knowledge gap and related elements. I'll stop there for questions or for glazes and stares. <laughs> Any questions or comments? Disagreements? Yes, I think there are a few mics here so So as you, as you look at a place like Penn State with this massive infrastructure and thinking, okay, if we're only going to monetize these immersive experiences, what do you do with all of the brick and mortar and all the people and all those sorts of things if you're going to be sustainable in 20 years? Well, I think in fairness, um, it, it's like anything else, is it's uh, Schumpeter's notion of creative destruction that uh, the willingness to early recognize that a landscape changes, is changing, and to respond to it in a reasonably innovative way puts you to some degree in charge of your own fate at a way that you perhaps haven't been able to do if you were waiting for someone else to do that to you. So first of all, I don't think physical spaces are going away, and I don't think physical spaces are irrelevant. In fact, uh, MOOCs done well actually are the best support for an existing university because you have faculty members at uh, Harvard or, or at Penn State or at Stanford that are reaching out to the world doing what academics or professors do and you're building the profile and the identity of a local university. So it's not that the, uh, but, but my whole argument was that the immersiveness of on-campus experiences is monetizable. The uh, depth of learning that adds a layer to what we currently do, that instead of just a blanket assessment by course, but actually assesses you by individual competencies. Those are the kinds of things that I think are gonna be significant going forward. I had this conversation earlier and I mentioned that in, in the late 90s when online conferences started gaining in prominence, there was this big section or big declaration that conferences were going to be dead. We were living in the golden age of conferences. I remember a colleague telling me like this is, this is in, in late 90s says this is we're in the final you know, twilight years of conferencing. It's uh, you know we're, we're just going to do everything online but there's value in face to face. There are, there's value those of you that, that came here internationally and in meeting with some of the colleagues that you don't have when you're online. So it, I see much of what's happening in online not as a replacement necessarily to universities but an augmentation because we've seen structural economic shifts in society and in higher education that uh, are altering the way in which we need and want to learn. So after decades of what I would call a demand side buildup in learning needs that the university hasn't responded to well by staying focused on the sequential students, the 17 to 22, 23 year old students, uh, to suddenly now universities realize, wait a second, there's, you know, these, these old people need, need learning too. And uh, so suddenly that's the landscape that is starting to emerge is it's, it's a much more enriching and a deeper relationship that universities that are proactive will have with their communities or with their uh, geographic regions. So George, um, if it's okay, I'm going to take one from our, uh, from our online and then we'll, we'll try to get around to the rest. Actually, um, I, I, online, that's, that's no good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I agree. I don't think it'll ever catch on no, with it. A hey, uh, a question here is about, it says in one of the first slides you presented, it was said that college enrollment is increasing, but traditional enrollment, I think by uh, on ground, is decreasing. Can you describe um, that phenomena? What do you mean by um, total enrollments online are decreasing? In, are you referring to the online space as mm. where the increases are? Okay, I, I hope I didn't say that because uh, globally at least, higher education as a whole is going to continue to increase for at least in the foreseeable future. Mm. I think we're in the range of 200 million learners in online or in university globally, which will continue 
to, uh, to increase. A lot of regions that have had local demographic transitions, which has resulted in somewhat of a decline in enrollment in certain regions, those areas have turned heavily to international students to fill some of those gaps. So uh, just to clarify, maybe I'll have to watch the video, but uh, to clarify that online learning is growing rapidly. In fact, it's the fastest growing, digital learning, let's put that way, digital learning at both corporate, university, and I guess three, uh, K to 12 sector is growing more rapidly than any other aspect of the education sector. The education industry, though, in terms of number of enrollments or students, is broadly growing internationally. There are regions, certainly some European countries, Canada and U.S. face a bit of it as well, where there's a bit of a population plateauing, which means we're drawing on international students to fill some of those gaps. But overall, there is not a decrease for enrollment in universities. Good, thank you. Um, let me go back to David, because I know he had a question. So with the... Um the, the, there's a lot of demands and there's a lot of things that are happening in terms of um, looking at uh, learning outcomes for students. I'm just wondering if you think that there may be different types of institutions that may emerge. Are we looking at one type of university that we're going to have lots of students or do you think there'll be room for corporate universities, universities for different uh, markets and, and things? I'm just curious what you think yeah. that'll evolve into. Yeah, I don't think that's a settled answer yet uh, be for several reasons. Probably the most pronounced is that it's not a foregone conclusion. A lot of what will happen for universities next will be determined by the vision that university presidents and university leadership is going to drive in the next several years. So I could certainly see if you have a university where, you know, it's just even World Campus, which, which is what, been around now since the 90s? So it been around since the 90s. I mean, there's an example of, of a visionary project that was, uh, was initiated that's had a long-term net positive impact on Penn State as a system. I think you probably still have the largest number of instructional designers per capita than probably any system in the US. And so those are the kinds of things that are, it's not a foregone conclusion that, that we're going to have the mega university or that we're going to have a series of specialized university systems. A lot of it will be due based on, will be based on the vision that's created by university leadership as they engage with the various stakeholders. The reason that MOOCs picked up attention so quickly, as I mentioned earlier, is that there was a, there was a, a growing demand for learning, and yet the university wasn't reflecting those demographic and work-related shifts. We entered a knowledge era in the last 30 plus years, and in that process, that means like, if I wanna learn about social network analysis, I can pick up a book at, uh, at a bookstore and, and read, but where could I take a, a course on social network analysis? Well, sure, I could take a summer school event, but that's going to be very much an academic experience, Or, but I might not want that. On the other hand, if somebody uh, runs a MOOC on social network analysis, I have access to that knowledge. I need that because I'm interested in it. I see it in the world around me, but universities failed to realize that emerging demographic. So the response to your question specifically would be, if university leaders stay close to the change pressures, track the architecture of knowledge and how that's changing, and the, the various requirements of stakeholders around knowledge and respond to that in a way that, that preserves the structure and integrity of the university, but also the needs and relevance of the learners. I think universities have the potential, some at least have the potential of being tightly integrated societal systems that are more critical than they've ever been. I have a, a question. I'm a president of a community college. And uh, relative to this construct that you have uh, laid out for universities, uh, that 40%, over 40% of America's higher education enrollment are from community colleges. Over 12 million uh, students yeah. are uh, community college students and um, uh, have a great impact, obviously, uh, on today's higher education system and the future of higher ed. So how do community colleges fit into this relative to what universe, how universities are going to have to adjust it and how we're going to have to adjust. Is it yeah. in the same way or do you see it a little differently? Have you looked at that at all? Uh, it's a great question and I'm perhaps not the best person to, to answer it, but the, the way that I see it, community colleges are critical specifically to local economies. That's one of the big impacts of community. I taught at, at Red River College was where I started teaching, which was a two-year college system. And what happens in a community college is very different from what happens, obviously, in a university campus. 
and the people that you know are involved in those systems uh, quite often these are even more so than in universities these are first in family uh, higher education participants and that means that someone who graduates from a community college often graduates a family somebody who graduates from a university they may just be well mom and dad already graduate so i'm just so I, I from what i saw at least when i was in the college system and that's been probably about 15 years now that may change somewhat but that was really a successful college community college graduate meant the prospect of a successful family in many ways economically so i think from that end there is a real pressure which is one of the things i was at, a, at an event last year where it was a summit we were looking at the future of, of the university and i had uh, one person after another stand up and say Universities are dying, universities are dying, universities are dying. And uh, so I finally had my chance to, to say my bit, and my argument was that, that you're all wrong. We're going to see more universities in the next decade or two, not less. And we're not going to see regionally, yeah, there's going to be pockets of universities or, or uh, smaller systems that might have to reorganize. For-profits are, are already being hit quite hard. But the state system, the relationship between a higher education institution and the economic prosperity of a region is a tight one, which means if you lose your local state university or if you lose a community college, you take an enormous economic blow. And there's no way that online providers are going to be able to duplicate what happens in a community college classroom. There's no way that an online state university can fully replace what happens physically on campus, whether it's in terms of knowledge or knowledge growth. I read an article recently, and I'm not sure I 100% agree with it, but it was a provocative argument that stated uh, basically that Detroit, if it would have had a large research-intensive university, Detroit could have survived you know, if they had a private university. That was, that was their argument. That, and I thought, well, that's interesting. And, and it's potentially, I mean, it's hard to do an A-B test, right? Let's take away that university, wait a uh, generation, and see if they're bankrupt. Um, but that idea, I think, resonates with us, that if you want to be an innovative region, if you want to be a... a a space that contributes to the knowledge economy, which most of, as I mentioned in the stats I showed earlier in terms of the percentage of the economy that is knowledge oriented, if that's the type of economy you want to be, you need more, not less universities. So the online medium is not going to necessarily displace universities and certainly not community colleges, which have always been more hands on. But I do think it will require college and university leaders to do a better job of articulating the valuable role that they play within those districts. And so that's one thing universities haven't done terribly well in the past. They haven't recognized that, you know, there's a reason why IBM doesn't wait for people to come knocking on their door, right? You have to go out and project an image and maintain that image. So I think that's something that university leaders and community college organizations will need to get a, a better grasp on. Thank you, George. Um, I, I'm having the, the impression that we have all the inquiry-based people over here, and we need some over there. Were there some questions we can get to? So um, I, I, I was listening to the idea, and I've heard this argument before about how online learning would sort of unbundle the education system. And um, I wonder that if online learning becomes a way of augmenting education and really concretizing learning experiences in tangible ways, um, it follows that this type of a system would favor those with time. And so those people who have less means and therefore less time to develop a collection of these types of competencies would be at um, a disadvantage because they'd have less time for augmentation. So I wonder to what extent folks have examined the unintended consequences of unbundling and monetizing these types of experiences for disadvantaged students. Uh, it's a great question for which I have no answer, but that doesn't mean that I'm not going to talk at you for a while. Awesome. <laughs> Uh, no, you're, you're absolutely right because that's one element and especially in digital environments, the the uh, experience of disadvantaged students or underrepresented students in digital environments uh, typically is negative. It adds yet another barrier to structural challenges that underrepresented students face. So universities, especially those that are, are the state systems that have a mandate to a state or a mandate to a region, uh, they have to think very hard about how are you going to make sure that as you become digital, and, and like I said, in my own life, I can't see 
a point where the digital game slows for me. I can't see a point where the digital game slows for society. You know, we're going to be more digital next year than we are this year, and that'll just keep being the case, which means that we need to increase our understanding of the experiences of underrepresented students in digital environments. Why do they fail disproportionately in those environments than do students who don't come from an underrepresented or a disadvantaged uh, background. But that's an area of research that's reasonably undeveloped, whereas underrepresented st uh, student population is reasonably well known. Underrepresented students in digital environments has not been extensively researched, but it's certainly an important area to look at. To that point, perhaps the latency that you talked about uh, can, in fact, be leveraged to help uh, the underrepresented. See, and that's the difficulty here. I, I agree. I would like it to be. Just like I would like the online medium to help more students be successful uh, that previously have not been able to access higher education. Unfortunately, the systemic barriers that underrepresented students face uh, suggest that it'll actually have the opposite effect that digital learning will actually create a bigger divide on some levels. Students that come from, students that come from an under, or a background that reflects uh, what we would now define as an underrepresented population don't have some of the support structures that are often needed or the skills that are needed. So we don't just need to offer online learning. There, we have to bring our students along with us as we move toward digital learning. I've had projects that I've tried where I've experimented online with different kinds of approaches to teaching and learning that have been horrible failures because I thought of something that I thought was clever, but it didn't match the life experiences and the life circumstances of those learners. And I'm a little concerned as we start to all jump on an innovation bandwagon that we become too clever for our students. And I don't mean too smart, that's a very different thing. I mean that we are trying to get the right media play and do the right thing that gets us the right recognition, but unfortunately doesn't resonate with the very real contextual needs that students face, particularly the underrepresented students. So when I talk about late knowledge activation, there's a certain type of proficiency as a learner. You have to have a degree of confidence that allows you to say, hey, I've learned this about statistics. You, there, there's that putting that out requires a certain type of personality to do that. So I can't say, hey, let's all share our knowledge and engage around that, but there may be individuals who culturally or whatever have uh, find that to be uncomfortable to do. They may not have the particular affective uh, skills or, or attributes, if you will, that would allow them to do that well. So I, I'm, I'm always cautious about thinking, how will this next great idea help underrepresented students? Because the issue with underrepresented students is not we haven't given you a great idea to look at. It's that we haven't spent enough time equalizing the life circumstances that enable you to be an equal participant. Hey, I've got an online question. If you don't mind, we'll take one here. Um, it's a great question because it's right up the zone of where our program for IELOL is oriented. It says, George, in your opinion, what kinds of leadership qualities will be needed and what kind of decisions will be needed in order to make existing universities like Penn State remain competitive in this new paradigm? Uh, that, that is a great question. Uh, see, these, kind of, these questions I always find a little unnerving because I'll answer it, but keep in mind I'm full of crap. <laughs> and uh, so I just want to make sure you're clear. Uh, because the, the solution to Penn State exists in Penn State. The opportunities for Penn State are here. You understand your culture. You understand your student population. I don't. I'm an outsider that, I mean, I, I've had some affiliations with, with Penn State uh, over the last several years that I very much enjoyed, but uh, an, an external expert can't solve local contextual problems. And, and it's not a problem. I know that it wasn't framed as a problem. But I just want to state that as a bit of a backgrounder to recognize that, that uh, the answer exists within Penn State to whatever opportunities you want to embrace. But I'll talk generically about leadership in a digital networked age. I think traditionally or even historically, we've learned to organize through organizations, whether that organization was a church or whether that organization was our place of business or, or a religious facility or, or whatever it was, but we organized through organizations. And we also learned to give heavy respect to certain positions within organizations. 
what's happened now though is as we shifted to networks and as a society we have you see this every time somebody tries to conceal something that they did that was particularly stupid let's say randomly oh i don't know i take a picture of myself wearing underwear and i tweeted to a bunch of people my last name is wiener so if you <laughs> do these kinds of things it has an impact and you can't you know you can't control what happens in networks so in a network system it's tough to be a controlling person because you, you'll always lose. So instead, networks require new ways of thinking about leadership. So suddenly, instead of, of uh, telling people what to do, you have to start thinking about nudging people in directions that you think are critical. Or you have to start looking at different approaches for consultative leadership. Or you have to look at models of shared leadership. Uh, probably most critically, I think a leader has to be able to articulate a compelling vision is you have to be able to say, uh, this is where we are today. I've talked to all of our stakeholders. They agree that this is the landscape or somewhat agree. And then to put forward a vision that people can get behind because it's not that our higher education doesn't suffer from lack of ideas. What higher education I think suffers from sometimes is a lack of leaders who are willing to take good ideas, articulate them well, get them moving and position it in such a way that other people start to see themselves as agents in that change process so that they get in behind the leader and start to make things happen that the leader might not even have conceived yet. But again, these are, the, these are, these are local questions that an external expert that answers. The only time you pay people a lot for that is if they're a consulting agency. And then uh, you, know, you can easily get uh, 50, 60 grand out of the deal and still get a worse answer. <laughs> But their laptops almost always work. Okay, so where are we? Uh, wow. Have you seen hi. their speaking budget? It's working. <laughs> Can you hear me? Um, hi. Hi. Oh, there we go. Hello. Yeah. Um, some of the latest research on how to uh, approach this topic of online learners, uh, particularly online learners from different um, strata, uh, socioeconomic strata, um, for example, at an institution such as ours, whose basic founding philosophy was to provide access for such students who are in a for-profit, not that all for-profits are the same, but particularly ours. Some of the latest research is sh that, that's on the real um, cutting edge is this predictive analytics movement of really taking a look at um, sort of the footprint of the student through the life cycle of your programmer of the degree to see where the fall down is more apt to occur and to do just in time interventions in the way of counseling, in the way of shifting sequences of courses, um, and to have institutions of higher ed assume more of that responsibility for success of the student rather than to blame or point out that it's the student's fault because they come from this. You know, that can be a very self-fulfilling prophecy. And the other thing for this young lady talking about the lack of time, kind of the contraction of time, sometimes the opposite is true, which is that online learning can enable more control of one's time by virtue of the fact that all of online learning, not all of it, but most commonly it's asynchronous which means you can do it in the morning before you get dressed to go to work. You can do it when you come home. You can do it when your kids are asleep. So just pointing out those two, those two points. Sure, so um, point one, yes, predictive analytics uh, are valuable. Uh, I think there we need to think more, I mean, let's put it this way. The role of analytics, and I've been very involved with learning analytics over the last uh, five years, and uh, recently did a paper for the uh, Australian government. It's on our the Solar the Society for Learning Analytics Research website. It was looking at how to increase the productivity and effectiveness of uh, national higher education systems, and uh, specifically we're focusing on Australia. So I, I have an affinity for the learning analytics community. But learning analytics do something quite specific, and that's typically they give us the ability to see a situation in different ways. They don't solve the situation, at, and they rarely provide answers. Quite often they provide more focused questions. And so I think when I look at predictive analytics and some of those opportunities, it's important to recognize the limitations of predictive models, and it's important to recognize the contextual factors that play in that are often overlooked by these predictive models. But absolutely, I think we need to take 
advantage of anything we can in terms of data, anything we can in terms of the, the digital trails that students leave. If we can say students who exhibit these patterns of behavior, there's something that Rio Salado says by day eight, they can tell with 70 plus, 80, in a 70 to 80% accuracy rate, whether or not a student will pass a course. Uh, that's an interesting thing. It's an interesting predictive model, but my question always is, that is useless to me until I am enabled with an intervention or until I'm enabled with a solution. Because telling me the world sucks doesn't make me feel so good. Uh, you know, give me something I can do to be a partner in the solution. But uh, anyway, so that's point, point one. Um, the second point that I completely forgot was... Oh, are you? Well, why would I say anything bad about a system using predictive analytics? <laughs> anyway, sorry. It was time management, the second one. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and so the, the, uh, you're, you're absolutely right that there are some, uh, learning the way we've done it traditionally, this is one of the drawbacks with much of the literature on online learning. There's been a, just a mess of comparative studies that try to compare on campus or face-to-face -face learning with online learning. And uh, it's very hard to compare huge things. It's like comparing, you know, should I, you know, is flying or driving better? Well, probably it depends where you want to go and how quick you want to get there. But they're very different systems. You can't compare them at that big of a level. But it is true that the uh, much of the literature initially focused on online learning as asynchronous interactions, which are very good for students who are self-regulated and self-motivated. Unfortunately, and this is especially the case with underrepresented students who face some barriers, the development of social cohesion and the development of social support systems that can often be very motivating like for a student in a cohort uh, that can be the difference between passing a course or not passing simply because of your persistence yes hi I, I don't want to beat this dead horse but I, I, I like do have horses. some another question to add in this general area but anyway uh, my interest I mean and we're we're, we're dealing now with the fallout of uh, you know, no child left behind and the public school system. So how is public school going to have to change to support this? Because I don't think it's something that you pop out of K through 12 and you jump into this and are successful necessarily. And I think we're seeing that now, regardless of whether you're in a, you know, um, an underprivileged population or not. And so I'm just interested in how perhaps higher ed can work with K through 12 or how is K through 12 going to have to change to support this different way of learning? That's, uh, I don't spend much of my time in K-12, to so uh, that's a preemptive comment. But one of the examples, not, not necessarily K-12, to for in our case it would probably 9-12 to 12 would be the more suitable target. So uh, we just initiated a, a, a MOOC that we'll be running in uh, May, where we're, it's an engineering MOOC where we're looking at that as a college preparation uh, move for students who are still in high school, so giving them the basic math skills and some of the, the uh, just to help prepare them for what university will be like. So those are the kinds of activities. I think there are a, a range of opportunities. Uh, there's For universities in particular, we should be thinking boundaryless. We should be thinking reaching into high schools to connect with students and give them opportunities to prepare. We should be thinking connections into the corporate landscape in a way that we're not doing yet, but we should be much more seamless in those life transitions. But right now, universities, it's almost like it's, uh, you know, it marks our lives so clearly and it really should make them very fluid in those different spaces so just broadly saying yes universities need to think differently about their relationship to in my case I would say the 9 to 12 sector uh, but I've been involved with universities in the past that have summer camps and robotics camps where they'll bring in students from grade 7 and 8 and and even younger to bring them into that experience as well we probably have time for one more question so Lorna I'm gonna switch over to this just to balance things out well, I don't know that this is the last question you want to end on, but it might be. You've identified a series of gaps, and you've indicated where we monetize those gaps, and you've indicated where you think that the next set of gaps is going to be and how those will be monetized. What happens after they're monetized? So first of all, I, I should monetization is sometimes in a university context it has some negative connotations uh, so monetization is what I perhaps another word way to put it uh, if I wanted to be more thoughtful would be to say that those gaps are opportunities for universities to add value to the lives of learners 
And so broadly speaking, if I was to say, if a student can come to us and say, I've, I volunteered over summer and another student, let's call him George, comes in and says, I played Xbox over summer. Those two students should be treated differently by the university from a null, and that adds an enormous value layer to the student that makes different choices in some of those areas. I mean, for all we know, maybe my Xbox actually positions me very well for a, for a you know, degree in, in video uh, game programming. But anyways, I'm just saying that those are the kinds of things that we want to talk about. What is the value that we add to the lives of learners that learners are willing to provide resources to the university for? And right now, we've talked, we've, we've lost the, that transition or that transaction around content. We've somewhat lost it around teaching because uh, MOOCs and that, for a lot of MOOC takers, they're taking it, uh, let's say, for uh, stats courses that you might be failing at your local university, but you can do a quick fresh up on, on Coursera and rewind until you get this one irritating concept right. So I think those are the kinds of things that are going to be hard to, for us to have for students say, yeah, I'm willing to pay for that experience. Uh, so what comes next after this? I really think there's two things that have to happen in, in the university sector in the next while, particularly for generating value for students. One is we have to get better at identifying, I'll, I've called this the personal knowledge graph, but this is where we begin to create uh, an articulation of what a student knows, that preferably the student should own, but it's what do they know, what have they done, what is their profile, much like Facebook gives me a profile of I've shared these images and I've done that. As I said earlier, we need that knowledge graph for individuals. Second thing that we need to do is move our curriculum to something that is adaptive or move our content to something that's adaptive. And that means that when I come in and I've spent my summer doing volunteer work and I've worked in the evenings and I have a certain profile of knowledge that I've developed that the university provides learning that is relevant to me. Now that doesn't mean that they just provide knowledge gaps because university is as much an ontological experience as it is an epistemological experience. So we also need to look at developing the whole person. We need to look at, uh, at constructing our identity and how we see ourselves and how we see others in relation to ourselves. So those are a range of things that we certainly need to engage in as well. Uh, but beyond that, I think those are the, the two biggest opportunities the universities have to contribute back to the lives of learners that's not exclusively defined by an economic relationship.